from ABC News. A television event. 100 years in the making. The century. October 1944. Private Joe Wheeler and thousands of his fellow American soldiers are under devastating fire from German artillery as they fight their way across Italy. It is Hitler these soldiers are trying to defeat, whose rise to power has resulted in the slaughter of millions. Private Joe Wheeler, his hands covered with blisters from digging foxholes, is trying to hang on. Half a world away, his brother John is in his own race to stop Hitler. John Wheeler is a physicist working on the Manhattan Project to develop an atomic bomb before Hitler does. They are driven by news from the front. From the battlefield, Joe sends a postcard to his older brother. The scientist understands his brother's message completely. The postcard says simply, hurry up. Tonight on the century, ultimate power. Good evening, I'm Peter Jennings, and welcome again to The Century. Adolf Hitler's massive crimes against humanity stand as one of the darkest chapters in the last hundred years. What is less familiar is how Hitler acquired ultimate power. That's our first story. It's an amazing one, especially when you realize that this man who sabotaged a democracy could have been stopped. Lonsberg Prison, near Munich, Germany. In 1924, the prisoner in cell number seven conceived of a master plan to seize absolute power in a highly advanced and democratic society. He was considered a delusional egomaniac by many, but in 10 years, he achieved his goal. In 1934, German democracy was finished. Adolf Hitler was the absolute ruler. One of his first acts was to commission this propaganda film, which played to packed houses throughout Germany for months. But triumph of the will disguised the truth. There was nothing inevitable about Hitler's rise. It was equally a triumph of luck, lies, and murder. Behind the image of the infallible dictator was a man whose triumph had been far from certain. When 18-year-old Adolf Hitler arrived in Vienna in 1907, his greatest ambition was to be accepted into the Academy of Fine Arts. A small town teenager in the big city, he had sketched and painted watercolors, including these, for several years. He was competent, but his work did not measure up to the standards of the Academy, and twice he was turned down. Well, he was flabbergasted. It apparently never entered his head that he would fail. And so when he did fail, he was completely taken aback by it. And that was, a, without question, a, a major setback for him, a really stinging blow to his pride. And within a couple of years, he'd slumped into the dregs of society and ended up in the flophouse for tramps and down and outs and so on. People who were really um, down to nothing. An outcast and a failure, Hitler's resentments shaped his actions for years to come. It's a great pity for mankind that he wasn't accepted into the academy. For a career as a mediocre painter, Germany would have been spared a dictator. On August the 2nd, 1914, 25-year-old Hitler can be seen in the crowd jamming the streets of Munich to hear a fateful announcement. Germany had declared war on Russia and Serbia. The photograph shows the beginning of Hitler's career, and he's filled with ecstasy because he's going to fight for a greater Germany. He's identifying himself personally with the cause of a greater Germany. This gave Hitler, for the first time in his life, a real sense of purpose. He'd found his role. He belonged for the first time somewhere. 
As a courier on the front line, Hitler was both brave and lucky. After several brushes with death, he was promoted to corporal and decorated. In October of 1918, he was temporarily blinded in a mustard gas attack by the British. While he was recovering, he heard of the German surrender, and this was a devastating piece of news for him. For the Germans, the end of the First World War was a devastating shock. In November of 1918, when the armistice was signed, German troops were still deep inside France. They occupied all of Belgium. They defeated the Russians. Also, during the course of the war, the German high command had fed the population a steady diet of good news. Germans at home had no idea that Germany was losing the war. So as far as most Germans were concerned, even in the last months of the war, Germany was winning. And then suddenly, inexplicably, in November of 1918, Germany has been defeated. This strange defeat would give rise to a stab in the back theory, that the army, the valiant German army, had been stabbed in the back by some sort of domestic coalition of left liberals, meaning Jews, um, the Catholic Center Party, uh, and the Social Democrats, the Marxists. The myth itself is nonsense. Uh, the German army high command uh, said in September and October 1918 that there was no way forward, that the German armies were exhausted, that Germany was at the edge of catastrophe. The big lie is the stab in the back. In the months following the German surrender, the country was near anarchy. There was a communist revolution and a counter-revolution. And then in February 1919, in a bitterly divided Germany, a fragile democracy emerged. But now you've got hundreds of thousands, indeed millions, of armed troops back in Germany, believing that they had been stabbed in the back. These would furnish the rank and file of the new wave of paramilitary organizations, which was important because many Nazis would be recruited from these units. The government secretly allowed paramilitary organizations to flourish because the terms of the treaty that ended World War I limited the German army to a mere 100,000 soldiers. One of the paramilitary leaders was Ernst Röhm, known as the Machine Gun King for his stockpile of weapons culled from returning soldiers. He met Hitler in Munich at a meeting of the tiny German Workers' Party, which soon became the Nazi Party. Hitler was a rousing right-wing orator, railing against the Jews, the leftists, and the national government in Berlin. And then in 1923, an economic collapse plunged the country into turmoil. And the German government responded with the printing press. They printed money, they printed money until trillions of marks equaled one American dollar. The southern German state of Bavaria had become a magnet for right-wing radicals, including Hitler. And in the midst of this crisis, the state commissar of Bavaria, Gustav von Kahr, thought the time was right to overthrow the national government in Berlin. At this moment, von Kahr and others saw in Hitler a very useful ally. Here was this man with great energy who could be recruited for the toppling of the government in Berlin. With Rome's paramilitary forces and Hitler's ability to inspire them, Rome and Hitler were well positioned to assist von Kahr with any revolt. At the same time, Hitler saw a possible coalition to hatch a coup, a putsch is the German term for coup, uh, Hitler saw an opportunity. This might be the objective revolutionary situation that he could use. But when von Kahr was warned off by the head of the German army in Berlin, von Kahr decided to wait. Hitler was outraged. He brought his stormtroopers to the brink, and he could not back down. At that point, Hitler has reached the position where if he pulls away from the putsch now, if he doesn't go through with it, his standing in the paramilitaries uh, might be blown once and for all. So Hitler then decides to go for it. Hitler gathered his stormtroopers outside a large beer hall where von Kahr was making a speech. Storming the stage, Hitler fired a shot into the ceiling and proclaimed that the revolution had begun. He called for a march against the government and led his followers out into the streets. Hitler's notions seemed to be that once this march took place, somehow the uh, population would rally around the march so the masses would rise up against the Berlin government. But the masses did not rise up. 
As Hitler and his stormtroopers approached a large square, they were confronted by the Munich police. It is unclear who fired the first shot, but within minutes, 14 stormtroopers and four police lay dead. Hitler suffered only a dislocated shoulder. Hitler himself was injured when the person he was linking arms with was shot dead. So what if, if the bullet had been 18 inches to the side, again, world history would have been different. Hitler managed to escape, but two days later, he was arrested and taken to Landsberg prison. As he awaited trial for high treason, he told the prison psychologist, I'm finished. If I had a revolver, I would use it. But from this political catastrophe, well, a catastrophe was, a, it was ludicrous. Hitler would, of course, in the trial in the spring of 1924, transform what had been a terrific political setback into a political triumph. He turned to the judges directly and said, Judge, I am guilty. I am responsible. You also want this democracy to be ended, but you don't have the courage. I have the courage to stand for my principles. And if that makes me guilty, then I admit it, guilty as charged, because I have a vision of this country, born in the trenches of 1914. And the rhetoric went on and on, and headlines all over Germany reported it everywhere. The right-wing court was sympathetic to his argument and had no interest in making a martyr out of Hitler. He received the minimum sentence. It was five years. He was not going to spend that long in prison. He would be out in less than a year. He might have been executed for this high treat, this crime of high treason. Instead, Hitler was put into a minimum security facility. In the photographs, he's sitting wearing lederhosen, a nice ruffly white shirt. The geraniums are in the windows. The room was so filled with his sycophants who had come to listen to his words of wisdom Hitler finally had to tell the, his jailers to please restrict admission to his cell because he couldn't get any work done. He had no privacy. The time in Landsberg prison was a turning point for Hitler. Here he would work to shed his identity as a rabble rouser and recast himself as a visionary politician. It was in Landsberg that he wrote the first volume of Mein Kampf, My Struggle, part Nazi manifesto, part boastful biography. It was also a record of what he had learned from his failed coup. From this failure, Hitler draws an important lesson, that he's going to have to use democratic politics to become a mass political movement. Basically, he's going to have to learn the lessons of democracy in order to take revolutionary power. He never did anything like this again. He never marched on Berlin, say, in 1933. He understood that in a democracy, with fully developed mass media. You can't have a revolution like Lenin did by overthrowing the institutions. No, he said, you have to use the institutions of democracy to defeat democracy. First, you get legally established in power, and then you erode the democracy. You destroy the democracy after you seize power. On December the 20th, 1924, Hitler was released from Landsberg prison. In 1929, with the onset of the Great Depression, Hitler moved from the margins to the mainstream of German politics. In keeping with his democratic strategy, a remarkably modern political operation had been established. The Nazi party's nationwide network of offices would be familiar to any precinct captain in American politics. Its mission was to put out the Nazi message. Hitler was interested in propaganda, pure and simple. That was their job. The grassroots organizations were to gather information. What did people like? What didn't they like? What played well? What didn't play well? And then to send that information back up the chain of command. What they had in mind was a very crude form of political survey research. And we even have the stormtroopers rebuild and carry out propaganda not to be playing soldier or carrying out a military pooch, but to work as a propaganda troop. And what this means in Hitler's view is passing out pamphlets, marching demonstrations, flags, the use of political violence against one's opponents, the disruption of opponents' meetings and all this sort of thing. That's still legal as long as it's directed against your opponents and not the government. 
The Nazis' main opponents were the communists who were preaching revolution. When Hitler called for their destruction, many middle-class Germans approved. If you saw a, a group of stormtroopers coming down the street, marching with the military band, with flag waving, maybe chanting, maybe singing, this was looked upon with great favor. And if it then became involved in fights with those on the left, that was good propaganda as well, because it showed the Nazis meant what they said when they said they were going to get rid of the Marxists. Hitler was a relentless campaigner. He went to as many as 20 cities in seven days. One of his most effective themes was that democracy doesn't work. Hitler ridiculed the system, and it was so easy to ridicule. In one of the most effective speeches, he says, People in Germany say, I'm un-German because I want to end this miserable system, a system dominated by 37 political parties. I was just recently looking, he says, at the electoral list from uh, the state of Lippe, that's the sort of Rhode Island of Germany, the smallest German state. What do I find? 37 different political parties. It is an absolutely wicked speech. And a great many Germans who were not drawn by the ideology, the expansionist, racist ideology of the party, saw this as a vision of a, a Germany united. At that time, this was a very powerful message, this idea of national unity. The greater the disintegration, the greater seemed to be the attraction of one movement claiming that it could transcend all the divisions of Germany and out of the ashes would rise a new phoenix and Germany would be great again. They were young, they were dynamic, and people could feel that they were contributing to an effort that was greater than any one of them individually. And particularly the women said, we belong to our movement, not a party, a movement, a subculture, a community. And anyone who comes in can have access to our soup kitchens. We have a sewing co-op. We have childcare for the children. We have a singing society. And in fact, demographically, the largest block of Hitler voters were women. He spoke about the masses as feminine, as susceptible to a kind of ecstatic experience. And if you watch his speeches, he was, of course, a fiery speaker. And he would thunder, and he would pound on the podium, and he would march around, and he would strut. And then, he would also step back during the applause and push his hair out of his eyes and almost have a, a soft image. And when you read the accounts by men as well as by women about how they found Hitler, there's almost no difference in the language of conversion experience between men and women. But behind the pageantry and the propaganda was another Hitler. A number of studies of Hitler's rise place emphasis on the sophistication of his propaganda, on the deep sociological forces and the economic traumas. All of these things are important. But it's important to remember Hitler's party murdered the best and brightest of his political opponents for years on end and that by crippling and terrorizing his opponents, that was at least, if not more important, than abstract economic and sociological forces in allowing Hitler to come to power. Germans could read the truth about Hitler. A group of reporters risked their lives to tell the world about the Nazi party. The most determined were the journalists of the Munich Post. Hitler gave lip service to the idea that he would only be pursuing power through methods of legality. 
What's so important about the Munich Post coverage is they reveal how much of a lie this was. To these reporters, this was a homicide story. Hitler was more a gangster than a serious politician. Year after year, for everyone to see, there were front page stories about stabbings and drownings and how members of the opposition parties simply disappeared. Hitler often dispatched Nazi party stormtroopers to the offices of the Munich Post where they would sack and pillage the offices and terrorize the people who were there. They risked their lives to set the record straight. They had a slogan, Hitler has no secrets from us. And in fact, they were able to produce one after another secret Nazi party documents, the most important of which being, I believe, the Nazi party plan for the Jews. The Munich Post reported in December 1931 that the Nazi party had a written plan for the fate of the Jews. The secret plan used the phrase, final solution, the key euphemism for the extermination, mass murder, genocide that Hitler would later carry out. It's a sensationally important story because it reveals that Hitler was contemplating the final solution as far back as 1931. But despite the daily front page revelations, Hitler's popularity continued to rise. From 18% in the elections of September 1930 to 30% in the spring of 1932. In the face of Hitler's growing political strength, the reporter Fritz Gerlich decided to use Hitler's own racist views against him. Fritz Gerlich's attack on Hitler, called Does Hitler Have Mongolian Blood, was a brilliant insight into Hitler's racial pathology. What it did was take Hitler's so-called racial science, take all the measurements of noses and chins and facial parts that all these quack racist scientists that Hitler gathered around him had developed and published in textbooks, take them, put them alongside photographs of Hitler and see how Hitler's nose measured up, how Hitler's chin measured up, how his eyes, the spacing of his eyes. He subjected Hitler to his own ridiculous racist science and found that Hitler was not the perfect Aryan. Hitler had more in common with Genghis Khan's Mongolian. But what he's really doing in this satire is really struggling for the soul of the German people. He's saying, don't look at the shape of noses, look at beliefs, look at beliefs that we can be proud of, beliefs in individual liberty rather than physiognomy. And unfortunately, he lost that struggle for the German soul to Adolf Hitler. On July 31st, 1932, Hitler scored his greatest political triumph to date. The Nazi party won 37% of the vote, the largest of any party in Germany. It seemed that Hitler could not be stopped. In 1932, Germany's head of state was the president, Paul von Hindenburg, the legendary leader of the army in World War I. He was the only man in the country who could appoint the German chancellor, the head of government, if there was no majority party in parliament. Hindenburg was 84 years old and presided over a country so divided that national elections were being called almost every two months. When Hitler won 37% of the vote in the July elections, Nazi supporters expected Hindenburg to make Hitler the chancellor. But Hindenburg despised Hitler. He thought he was a reckless upstart from the lower class, never to be trusted with power. But without the Nazis, a coalition government could not be formed. Hindenburg offered Hitler the vice chancellorship. Hitler refused. For him, it was all or nothing. When Hitler refuses, those not in the hardcore of the party, particularly middle-class people that were not committed National Socialists, they said, well, why not enter the government? We voted for you because you were going to go in and clean up, clean the house, and now you've had the opportunity, you've not done it. Are you just like all the other parties that talk, 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 but then don't do anything? The disillusionment of middle-class voters was only part of Hitler's problem. His own party was in open rebellion. Hardcore Nazis, the stormtroopers, they didn't want to go into the government as some kind of coalition partner. They wanted to seize power. They thought this was going to happen in August after the election. And now it hadn't happened. In their minds, many of them were beginning to think the legal campaign is not working. And maybe this was never going to work and we should go back to the old ideas of 1923 and try to take over by violence. 
the stormtroopers on their own, not with orders from above, simply conducted a campaign of terror. The violence was getting out of hand. They began to attack local officials and respectable middle-class Germans. And this made many people begin to realize the true character and begin to draw back. The collapse of Nazi support was immediately clear in the fifth election of the year. On November the 6th, Hitler suffered a devastating defeat. The Nazis lost over two million votes and dropped 34 seats in the parliament. The Nazi vote had dropped like a stone. Hitler's propaganda staff produced a top secret report. And it says, we've blown it. There was an even greater blow in early December when Gregor Strasser, head of the party's political machine and Hitler's second in command, suddenly resigned in protest because of Hitler's all or nothing policy. Strasser, out of the blue, resigns all his party offices. Major crisis in the party, major debacle for Hitler, prestige loss and so on. Hitler's response was to summon together all his most trusted chieftains and addresses them then in a melodramatic performance with tears rolling down his cheeks, threats of suicide if the party breaks up and so on. So at the end of 1932, the Nazi party is in a mess. It was a heartbreaking moment of hope because it seemed that Hitler was on his way out. And there was a cartoon that the Munich Post published that showed Hitler kicked out the doors of power by the electorate. And the Munich Post gives it a triumphant caption, Adolf Hitler on his belly again, in reference to the beer hall push when Hitler was seen to dive to the sidewalk. And here again, it seemed like he was on his belly again. It was at this very moment, with Germany in yet another political stalemate, that Hitler was saved from obscurity by events over which he had little control. There are two common misconceptions about how Hitler first came to power. One, that he seized power through a military coup, a putsch in German, and two, that he was elected by the German public. Both are incorrect. In fact, Hitler's power was handed to him by conniving politicians who thought they could control him and use him to further their own ambitions. The man most responsible for Hitler's good fortune was Franz von Papen, the former chancellor of Germany. At the beginning of 1933, he'd recently been replaced in office by a fierce political rival, the Minister of Defense, General Kurt von Schleicher. Deeply embittered by his sudden removal, Papen was determined to get even with Schleicher and get back in power. And so he made a deal with Hitler. He set out to convince President Hindenburg to appoint Hitler chancellor. Papen would be vice chancellor. He told President Hindenburg that Hitler, weakened by his failure in the last election, could be tamed, especially if he was surrounded by responsible politicians like Papen. Papen even said, don't worry, we've hired him. After a series of lies and deceptions designed to overcome Hindenburg's deep misgivings, the president finally agreed. And so on January 30th, in what must be one of history's bitterest ironies, that at a moment when the Nazi constituency seemed to be unraveling, Hitler is appointed chancellor. That night, the Nazis staged a massive demonstration in Berlin. Hitler and Hindenburg waving from separate windows to the cheering crowds below. For Hitler, this was only the first step. His ultimate goal was absolute power. When Hitler took over as chancellor, he faced the same problems as his predecessors. He had no majority in parliament, and he had to stay in the good graces of the president, the only man who could remove him. This was not the absolute power Hitler had in mind. But quite quickly, a spectacular event helped him. A month after becoming chancellor, the Reichstag, the German parliament building, was set on fire. A former communist was arrested and put on trial. But for Hitler, the fire was a timely stroke of luck. It gave him an excuse for a brutal crackdown against his opposition on the left, the likes of which Germany had never seen. They arrested the communists. They harassed and censored political parties, particularly the Social Democratic Party, the moderate socialists. 
In addition, Hitler deputized the stormtroopers. They're now the police. It was the day they had been waiting for. They arrested so many people that the jails overflowed and they had to create a new institution. It was called the Konzentrationslager, the concentration camp. They just round up leaders of the Social Democratic and Communist Party, drag them down to one of these concentration camps or torture cellars, take them there, beat them, in some cases murder them. If husbands went into exile, the Nazis would arrest the wives and children and throw them into concentration camps. The terror, the reprisals were instant. And as long as it's directed against the left, um, it's condoned and tolerated by large elements of the middle class. On March the 21st, the reopening of Parliament provided a propaganda opportunity to recast the Nazi Party's image of brutality and radicalism. To create the illusion of continuity between the old and new regimes, Hitler chose the garrison church for the ceremony, the great shrine of Imperial Germany, where Kaiser Wilhelm held court and Frederick the Great was buried. This day was a carefully orchestrated event by the Nazis aimed at reassuring conservative Germans and President Hindenburg that Hitler was not some wild-eyed radical who's going to turn the country over to the stormtroopers. It did bother some of Hitler's more radical supporters. They had some worries about the alacrity with which Hitler seemed to be joining with Hindenburg. But generally, this day played very well. That was the turning point in, in public opinion. Movies were taken and fed directly into the newsreels. And it looked as if Hitler, dressed in civilian clothes very, very properly, had been tamed after all. Suddenly, it was respectable to support the Nazis. The charade of a tamed Hitler was exactly that. Revealed by his plan to push through something called an enabling law, which would enable Hitler to rule by decree. He needed a two-thirds majority to get the enabling law passed. On the day of the vote, he left little to chance. This meeting took place in the sea of stormtroopers. Stormtrooper units surrounded the parliament building. They were inside. Some of them, of course, members of the parliament. And they made it very clear as other deputies came in that if they didn't vote for the enabling act, that they may not go home that night. As Hitler enters the chamber there, there was no doubt whatsoever of the need to impress a sense of fear and menace in the opposition on that day. And indeed, the opposition had been reduced in effect to the Social Democrats. There's one capitulation that's particularly noteworthy. The representatives who had been elected by Catholic voters capitulated and signed on to Hitler's power. And so, in other words, the leaders of the political party did what the voters had refused to do, and that is to agree to Hitler becoming dictator. The die was now cast, the enabling act passed by a huge majority, and that, of course, then set this dictatorship on its course. By 1933, the Nazification of Germany, the reordering of German society under Hitler, took many forms. At every level, an entire panoply of social clubs in almost every small town and village in Germany Nazified itself. Skittle clubs, gardening associations, singing clubs. Hitler's portrait was to be found everywhere. His face was at the bottom of bowls on cups, streets named after him, kids were named after him. So there's an enormous set of impulses released from below here without all the time directives from above. Hitler does very little in these months in terms of any directives to coordinate these groupings. One really good example of local initiatives is the book burnings in Berlin in May 1933, organized by university students acting on their own initiative, were not organized from above. The leading German authors, Nobel Prize winners and so on, found their works then thrown on these bonfires which were rising up outside the buildings of all Germany's major universities. Initiatives taken by the students and by their professors. But despite the seemingly unstoppable wave of popular support, one last obstacle to total power for Hitler remained. President Hindenburg and the German army command were increasingly concerned that the Nazi party was out of control. 
the Army still remained a very real threat to Nazi power. If the Army grew disaffected, if Hindenburg woke up one morning and decided that this had all been a mistake and sent for a military attaché, who knew what could happen? Their main concern was the stormtroopers. They'd grown to vast proportions and were now demanding their share of the spoils. They've uh, brought Hitler to power. What are they going to get in return? And by the summer of 1933, they really didn't have a purpose. Because once they had been used to suppress the left, really their function was done as far as Hitler was concerned. So as time went on, Hitler was faced with the dilemma that the stormtroopers, who by this time are acting as political hooligans, were causing a lot of trouble now with the army leadership. The army is increasingly worried about the threat of the stormtroopers to supplant its own position. And Hitler is being put on the spot of having to choose between the army and the stormtroopers. Ernst Röhm, who still commanded the stormtroopers, had become a real threat to the German high command. Röhm now begins to call for the stormtroopers to be merged with the military. He wants to create a people's army, a revolutionary national socialist army. But the Minister of Defense, General Werner von Blomberg, was well aware of Röhm's ambitions. General Blomberg was quite concerned about Röhm and the stormtroopers. They'd served their purpose. They'd fulfilled their mission. And Röhm didn't seem to understand this. All of this incautious talk about absorbing the army and becoming a people's army and so on was not what Hitler wanted to hear, not what Blomberg wanted to hear. Determined to avoid a confrontation and desperate to regain control, Hitler called the stormtroopers to a mass meeting. <laughs> Despite Hitler's pleas, the conflict between the stormtroopers and the army was becoming a crisis. Adding to the urgency was the failing health of President Hindenburg. Hindenburg was now seriously ill and unlikely to recover. And if the army didn't support Hitler as the head of state, Hitler would have been in a very difficult position indeed. With the army, if the army could be brought on board, then total power would be in Hitler's hands. So Hitler made his deal with the army. Blomberg agreed to support Hitler taking presidential powers when Hindenburg died, if Hitler would deal with the stormtroopers' leader, Rome. But in the case of Ernst Röhm, he was dealing with one of his oldest co-fighters. He'd known Röhm since 1919. Röhm had been very influential in helping Hitler in the early years in Munich. And Hitler did have this streak in him, which was of some loyalty towards people who had in his view, done him a great service in the past. It's a hard dilemma for him. He'd been friend with Röhm since the beginning, and Röhm is one of the few people that uh, Hitler talked to using the intimate form, the do form of address. But the precipitating event for Hitler to take action was that Hindenburg was going to die. On June the 21st, 1934, Hitler went to visit the dying Hindenburg at his country estate. And who should he meet there? But Defense Minister Blomberg, who's just come away from seeing the ailing president, and Blomberg tells Hitler in no uncertain terms that he needs to act now against the stormtroopers. The military is willing to do its part if Hitler will do his part. And Hitler decides to do his part in late June. On June the 30th at 2 a.m., Hitler boarded a plane for Bavaria. He had called a meeting of the stormtrooper leadership to be held at a resort just outside Munich. Hitler arrived at dawn and was driven to the hotel where Rome and the others were sound asleep, utterly unprepared for what was about to happen. Hitler stormed up the stairs with his pistol drawn. He burst in on Rome and arrested him. <laughs> 
as the secret police stalked the halls, breaking through doors and yanking the stormtrooper leaders from their beds. They were all taken to Stadelheim prison in Munich. And there, the murders began. Most of them were shot within hours. But on Hitler's orders, Rome was given a choice. He was handed a gun he could take his own life. He declined. So standing in his cell, he was shot in the head. Meanwhile, in Berlin, the SS rounded up 150 other high-ranking stormtroopers and took them to the Lichterfeld Cadet School, where they were lined up against the wall and shot by a firing squad. This was only the beginning. Hitler had all scores to settle. When former Chancellor von Schleicher answered his door, he was met by a gunman. When his wife came running, she was murdered too. Gregor Strasser, the former head of Hitler's political operation, was dragged to the basement of Gestapo headquarters, where he was murdered. Fritz Skerlich, the Munich reporter already imprisoned at Dachau, was shot in the head and his blood-splattered glasses delivered to his widow. Even Gustav von Kahr, the former Bavarian commissar who wouldn't go ahead with the beer hall putsch 11 years earlier, was remembered that day by Hitler as a traitor. He was found hacked to death in a ditch. The killings continued through the following afternoon as Hitler gave a tea party in the Chancellery Gardens. Just about a month later, on August 2nd, Reich President Hindenburg died. And on that day, indeed, that very same day, the army now let the other shoe drop. It now came the payment. The army swore personal allegiance, not to the German constitution, not to the German people, not to the German state, but to the person of Adolf Hitler. The last obstacle to total power in Germany had been eliminated. Adolf Hitler! Hitler! 